was uh, something that just surprised the whole world. It's a big challenge to the existence of Europe and to the history of Europe. The only war we are at at this moment is the war against the pandemics. Decretar el estado de alarma en toda España. But we will continue to do everything. morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are based. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, all the participants in this session who joined us uh, in this project, despite this uh, hard, tough, and uh, of course, challenging times we are living in our industry, in, uh, all over the world, and of course, also in our travel industry. But uh, before introducing our today's speakers, let me introduce uh, the project FORWARD. FORWARD is an international community and a space for debate, for debate like this, uh, to share knowledge and new ideas, new businesses, and uh, above all, try to find answers to the most urgent questions of our industry. And these urgent questions right now are, of course, related with uh, coronavirus. This is exactly the reason to be here today with the brightest mind in destination management. And uh, just before starting the, in the introductions, I will uh, please let me send a kindly request to all of you uh, watchers and viewers of this session to uh, donate as much as possible to Save the Children, the NGO for this session, uh, because our support today can help the children and save. Um, households, help protect and prepare doctors and health clinics in refugee camps and help support distance learning in the face of school closures. And now uh, let's uh, welcome the moderator, Douglas Lansky, world famous uh, travel speaker. And um, as told me just five seconds ago, a brand new YouTuber. <laughs> yes. Welcome you all, uh, please Douglas. I'm mostly doing it to embarrass my kids, but I need a project to do while I'm home. Uh, hi, and um, I'll be the moderator for today. And I'm gonna start by just doing a quick round of moderation introduction stuff. And we're gonna start with my good friend, Petra. Uh, Petra, you've been the CEO of Ljubljana Tourism for, wait for it, 17 years. Is that correct? No. <laughs> oh gosh, thank God no. <laughs> I've been with uh, uh, with Ljubljana Tourism for so many years, that's true, but CEO now for four plus three, plus two, five, six years altogether. That's a lot of math, but okay. <laughs> this isn't a math <laughs> webinar we're, not, we're doing here. Um, and then if, as if that weren't enough, you're also the head of European Cities Marketing. Those are two very big hats to wear. So I'm really, it's gonna be exciting to hear from different perspectives that when you, you jump in. And then uh, going with the old fashioned ladies first, we're gonna go with, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right. This is easier than the volcano, so should I, she should be able to get this. Very good. Almost? Almost? Very, yes. Okay, and, and now if I'm, and, and jump in if I get any of this wrong, but as, as it's um, been made clear to me, you are the director general of the Icelandic uh, Tourist Board for many years, and again, as if that weren't enough, as if you weren't busy enough, you, you're also the, was it the Vice President of Sustainability for the European Travel Commission? And then like it went for four paragraphs of other things you were doing at exactly the same time, which is just boggling the mind. Um, but now you've traded your volcanoes and geysers for warm water, beaches, and a totally different language. And you're now running the, you're the, the Director of Destination Management at that Red Sea Development Company in uh, Saudi yes. Arabia. Are you yes. in Saudi Arabia now? Yes, I am. Okay, wow, exciting. And then finally we have David Mora, 
international tourism consultant, professor, speaker. You've been working over 20 years in the tourism field, helping dozens of destinations around Spain, my, primarily in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, yep. help them with product development and all sorts of things. And you're from Bilbao. You're in Bilbao now? Uh, yeah, uh, I live in the surroundings of Bilbao City sure. in, the, in the Basque Country, up in the north of, uh, of Spain. Okay, and I'm told that you're, you're into either wine tourism or maybe just wine. Well, of food, wine tourism, I, I run a master's degree in food tourism in, the, in San Sebastian uh, at the Basque Culinary Center. Uh, but not, not only food tourism, because my PhD studies are uh, about uh, music tourism. So I'm broader than that. Okay, L let me just jump, kick things off. And by all means, if you feel like you want to, I don't want to just be me doing all the chit chatting and questions back and forth. So if you've got a question for anyone else, Let's jump in, but I want to start off with Petra. Marketing. I don't yeah. know. Can we mark? Can we market our way out of the coronavirus? Well, I personally hope that we don't just market our way out of coronavirus. That you know we literally do something about the whole situation and and uh, you know start from the sort of a scratch on a healthier ground. But yeah, it will be. I mean. Now that everything got quiet down and we got to used to it, it would be nice to go back to cities as well but with some hustle and bustle. But you know, the ones that are more positive, bright, comfortable, and so forth. So these are the so these are the actual the, the marketing bases that we can start with after in the post-corona era. You know. But the thing is that. You have all these DMOs which have marketing built into their name. They're marketing people with marketing budgets. And now you can't, they kind of have to do, you can't do so much marketing right at this minute. So what are they doing? And are, are they bringing in new skill sets? Are they bringing in people from the destination management side? Or are they, just, are they using this downtime to help retrain some hotel staff or build some new things or renovate hotels? Like how can these marketing people be effective when they're not marketing you know the fact is that even though it is a name marketing in the name of organization a lot of these organizations don't wear uh the name marketing for a long time anymore dmo means more management even dmmo is not uh so much um, in front so it's more managing than marketing and it's that's not like situation from now on that is already for several years, but uh, the managing the managing position is coming from the DMO side, is coming up front now the most, because we first needed to cope with the shock that just suddenly happened. Then we needed to start with the crisis communication right away, because this was the, this is the very first and basic step to do when this type of things happen. And we're talking about a situation that no one ever was in before. So we're all of going from so many feelings uh, that are in, mixed into this business from first shock, then hope, then hopefully clarity, and at the end, you know, hopefully victory. So yeah, the, now the crisis communication involves all the stakeholders to talk to them, to brief with them through their um, positions and from, and then take new steps, you know, the, from the logistical challenges, a lot of them have them, the other PR headaches, and then finally to health and safety implications. Uh, tourism is actually, in, should be in all places, uh, glued together through DMOs. Okay, and, and Olaf, talk, talk to me about using this time wisely. I mean, you're working at a development company now. Um, you're developing stuff in, in, you know, in theory at least. Yeah hopefully in practice as well, is this downtime a time when places could be doing, because often, you know, you see these signs that say closed for renovation. Well, here's a perfect time to do yep. some of that stuff. Uh, is, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, looking back at, if I look back at my previous position in Iceland, I think that is actually the more relevant uh, reference in, in the case of what we're going through now, because obviously, in the 10 years I was there, we went through an, uh, you know, an economic bankruptcy almost in 2008, 
and then mm -hmm. we had the beautiful eruptions of 2010. Uh, so, you know, so we went through, so there was a lot of, and, and I mean, tourism it has shown itself to be fairly resilient oftentimes. Uh, but of, of course, what we're going through now is unprecedented. And I don't think that we can downplay the economic impact of that on the companies involved in and, and who form the backbone of tourism in most countries. And those are the SMEs, the, the, the small enterprises that often are cash strapped that rely on the next cash flow for the next month and it's there that maybe governmental uh, governmental uh, assistance is is needed just to keep things afloat for the time being because obviously having to start from scratch after a, a load of, of small and medium enterprise bankruptcies will be very difficult for destination mm. it is also a time where you need to acknowledge the important roles also of the big players the airlines the the big DMC, you know, and, and all those actors also, and of government who take care and safeguard and steward many of the assets that tourism relies on. So I think that now, as never before, it's it's very important for all the stakeholders to come together to look at what is a uh, a uh, a realistic approach to the short-term and long-term impacts of this and then looking into that and trying to learn from previous crises a the economic crisis which took a bit of time to get out of and then you have crises like like the like the eruption in in in, uh, in AFA good in 2010 from which you know tourism bounced back very quickly this seems to be some sort of mixture of that and i think that we yeah we, we just need to be realistic that this will be a difficult time for destinations there will be big challenges uh, in the months to come in all international travel uh, the companies and the, and the destinations and the regions that can should use the time wisely to maybe reboot look inward towards how they can strategically approach tomorrow's tourism which might want to be more responsible and which will also then have a, a maybe a a uh, new focus on, on safety issues with regards to health. There might be, I mean, maybe hotels need to move away from breakfast buffets. Maybe, you know, mass transportation needs to rethink itself, at least for, for a while. But then let's not forget that, that human minds are fickle. And in the long run, we will bounce back from this. People will travel again, but we can't decide that it'll only take a couple of months because I don't think that's a factor. Mm. And how do, David, what do you think? If you take a place like Bilbao, let's use that as an example, aside from maybe getting rid of breakfast buffet boards, like what do you think is going to be the big difference? Let's say this thing lifts in the, at the end of summer. What do you think is going to be, first of all, what do you think is going to be different? And what do you think the destination should, like when they reopen their gates, what should they be doing better or differently? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, to start off, it, uh, the, the analysis depends on our location and um, myself, um, Spain is one of the, the worst locations uh, in, in, in this very moment with Italy, France coming ahead too and the, and the States. For us is a very, very harsh time. Uh, we are going through uh, a really, really terrible moment, moments. Um, but we are trying to move on and we have already some destinations like Costa del Sol, uh, Seville, uh, Catalonia, uh, DMO, uh, they are already working with stakeholders, as uh, Olof already mentioned, uh, towards the new normal. Uh, and this new normal will at least for us will be the whole 2020. Um, I don't see no uh, uh, foreign visitors coming to Spain in this year. Um, that also, I think, depends a lot on the vaccine. When we have uh, not just the vaccine itself available for all of us, so I think for us, 2020 is uh, is gone uh, regarding uh, foreign foreign visitors, and so we depend mostly on uh, the internal movement of Spaniards. Uh, and they already and. Actually, I was working today on a post to uh, 10 questions that uh, destinations should be uh, making themselves what to do now. And, and being in contact with all the stakeholders of the destination, I think, is uh, a key factor right now. 
uh, we have these tools now that uh, uh, the technology is provide, providing us to keep on working uh, on the new strategy. Our previous strategy uh, is useless. There's a new situation and we have to work on this new uh, strategy. Maybe it's for the short midterm. I hope, as all of them mentioned, that we will travel again and maybe 2022 we will be back in the good old days. But for 2020 and 2021, 20, uh, we have to be prepared for something completely different, and we have to go all together uh, in the in the in the same path. Uh, and here in the Basque Country, we uh, one of the our key assets is food. Um, it's 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 gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard for for displaying this this uh, feature that we have uh, for for the for the next months. Yes, indeed. Well, there's, there's two things. One, I mean, the vaccine is obviously the magical unicorn. Once you get that, you can return to normal and everyone's happy. However, if we don't have that for a while, um, two things. Usually when there's one kind of a, a terrorist attack or a weather-related catastrophe, it's very isolated. It doesn't affect everyone in the world. It's that spot. And so it's not like the global economy collapses. This one's unique in that the global economy is sort of collapsed. So when this thing, even if it goes back online, in June, people in general aren't going to have as much money, but they're all getting this great wanderlust while they're all in lockdown mode. They're just dreaming to get out. So they're going to maybe have less money, but dreaming to get out. You think that does that those two things together? Does that Petra? Does that up towards add up to short short range travel? Those two things. Well, short range travel, at least, uh, at least as uh, city, what city breaks are concerned, were in in uh, were popular also beforehand. But now the approach will definitely be uh, different. Uh, yeah, as the uh, all the surveys and all the trends now show that people will be hungry to uh, travel around their own familiar locations. Uh, at least in their countries or m max their neighboring countries at first, uh, but also in general the I mean the 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 the, um, uh, the products will change. You know, like um, the, now we needed to digitalize digitalize through the night. Basically, even the public entities, which was mission impossible beforehand. You know, everyone now really works online. Now we are, you know, working on digital um, um, tour guiding. The, the you know this small stuff, but also bigger stuff like um, you know mice. How are they going to pick up? Uh, how quick are they going to pick up? How the thing will start off with masks on all the receptions with two meters stools apart on the conferences when they happen out of virtual world which eventually will happen because we want to meet each other it's how we are so these type of questions now are still a little bit um, in vain and not clear but are arising and I don't know you know the planes are taking their uh, physical planes out of uh, business, which are whichever are still flying, and taking the seats out. So the you know the restaurants will stools be more apart, the chairs will be more apart. So that means less capacity. So that means uh, high or you know higher or more expensive products. So uh, changes are going to be abrupt, and the sooner we get used to them, the better for us. I was just thinking, like, the young people who are maybe going to be less afraid as this thing starts to trail off, the young people who aren't afraid of serious illness as much, and, and less, also there's just more courageous people out there who maybe they've either had it or, uh, or they're just young and courageous or whatever. Um, it seems like one of the biggest fears that they have is not so much catching this virus, is that they're going to get trapped in Australia on the other side of the world they're going to get trapped somewhere and can't get back for weeks or months yeah. or whatever and end up isolated from their family yeah. what does the travel industry need to do to sort of come up with some guidelines or special medevac planes or something to get people home well i think that i don't think that there i mean at the end of the day it won't be the airlines that make those decisions it will be you know public officials and health officials probably However, I think, I mean, this can be an impediment for business travel in the short term, because, I mean, obviously, 
you you know you're, you're a bit put off on going on a two-day trip to a conference if you have to spend you know two weeks in quarantine when you get back so that'll be a but I think that so so I agree with David that I think that international travel in 2020 is pretty much out of the picture just because of the complications. I mean, the airlines, now I'm not an airline specialist, but the airlines need to, you know, revamp their whole connectiv connecti connectivity and, the, and their whole schedules. I mean, everything everything is very, very difficult for the airlines now, presumably. So that all needs to be revamped. We'll probably figure out some sort of new normal with regards to health and, and safety issues at airports and in airplanes, as Petra mentioned. You know, sort right. of like a after 9-11 when we suddenly got used to all the extra security issues at airports so that's something that people will come up with uh, so i so i don't so i think that this will all take time and be a very very complicated process of you know might be a fairly complicated process in sort of restructuring the whole thing of international travel and that will mean that the flight dependent destinations will struggle in the in the short term as Petra also mentioned I mean, neighboring countries or, or you know, very short term within Europe, international travel within Europe across borders on the mainland, that will probably start sooner than international air, airline travel because also, I mean, suddenly airplanes were like the vectors for, for the virus, if you will, you know, in, in many people's minds. And then people will need to feel safe in that regard before they start, you know, traveling with their families, I would presume. Yeah, it's, it's not a surprise that the tourism hubs of the U.S., Spain, Italy, France, these places that are huge tourism hubs are some of the worst hit by the virus. But I mean, as someone who I think has had the virus already, I mean, I had all the classic symptoms. I was right up there in northern Italy. I was, you know, sick, coughing, all that kind of stuff for quite some time. Um, and now, assuming I had it, I'm fine. And I'm theoretically <laughs> immune for a while. We don't know how fast it mutates. It doesn't change because these viruses change, and there's a well, lot of there's a lot yeah, of change. Virus already. I was watching this professor who is the head of immunology in South Korea, and he said, as we the data they have now shows it lasts like a typical flu season. Like if you're if you wait, they can tell now is if you had it now and already had it, you're likely immune for this season. You can't put an exact date on it. But let's just say, I used to travel when I was a backpacker long ago with those yellow vaccination cards that showed my had my yellow fever shot and all that stuff. Had it with me all the time. I don't think any country ever asked to see it. But <laughs> I always had it. What if we had this like digital thing where I could get tested because we have the technology for a blood test to see if I've had the antibodies. And those millions of us who've already had it and are fine now, that we are immune and if they could let's say they find out it's mutating faster they could suddenly update the uh you know sort of the exp expiration date on our card so okay i maybe thought that i could travel for a year but now they're saying no no, no you only have seven months but for those seven months i could be traveling and fueling the economy restaurants bars going everywhere with millions of other people who've already had it and had proven antibodies so when we show up at a destination we just wave this they can go online and check it, make sure it's authentic, and we got a free cart, a ah, free, uh, free card to go right in. I wanted to say carte blanche, but why not use us who've had it, assuming I've had it, to, I mean, we could help keep the economy going and the travel industry going, but no one seems to be talking about this as a solution. What's up with that? Anybody, jump in. <laughs> Um, but that, that, that requires a global response to the crisis, and uh, I think there is uh, no, no such a response so far coming from the uh, from the governments. But surely, uh, with Trump's national... amazing leadership, come on. <laughs> I, I don't know. I suppose in your countries, in uh, Saudi Arabia, I, uh, Iceland, and Slovenia, I'm sure governments are giving a very good response. In our case, it's complete havoc. Um, very, very difficult to respond uh, when you have every day 700, 800 people dying. So what, what you are saying, what you're proposing will be great, but uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't see that coming uh, maybe in a couple of years and maybe coming from Asia, but uh, not coming from, from Spain, uh, I'm sure about that. Okay. You think the technology and that kind of testing and that kind of coordination is just going to be slow to get 
on board for this season. No, now actually here the government is working on a on an application that uh, actually they are already uh, controlling us. Uh, they just approved an act that gives them the permission to control our cell phones. Uh, I suppose that will be to control those who are infected or have the symptoms so that they control um, them to remain at home or they are also speaking about maybe trans, uh, transporting those uh, infected persons to hotels, um, sports facilities and, and keep them there and using cell phones to control if they remain there and so that the immune such as yourself or those who are very strong as myself we can move on <laughs> with our normal yeah. lives but that's that's just uh, under under uh, under discussion uh, currently okay. here and, and all of you are going to say something as well jump in uh, i was just going to say that that you know even though yes i mean this this idea has been floated that that the people that are immune might be you know there might be some sort of hierarchy in that however i think that while we have because we don't know we don't actually know how this, how the, the virus will spread, you know, will spread around the world. And I think the main thing is that people will, I mean, that governments or countries don't want to uh, to risk a new, a new, you know, a new infection starting to spread, mm -hmm. which would might, might happen through, in, you know, through international travel, because also. Uh, I mean, many people don't show any symptoms. The virus seems to live on surfaces, but although that is not a, a big. Deal. And also, we have the. I mean, also because the it, it has been discussed that the virus might, you know, diminish over the summer, but it probably won't disappear. I mean, the flu doesn't disappear in the summer; it just becomes less, both because of behavioral uh, reasons and because of biophysiological -physi reasons within the virus within viruses themselves. But I mean, what happens if we get a new breakout in the autumn? You know, I think there are so many insecurities, and I do think that governments and then right. from the airlines will want to err on the side of of uh, on, of, on, of conservatism in that respect. What about insurance companies? Oh, sorry, Petra, jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with all of the idea has been floating around. It's we've been talking about it, obviously, because we are, you know, gra grasping to everything. But there are several magic unicorns here. The vaccine being the last one, uh, the the one that could also do a part of the trick is that at least to find the medicine that would uh, that would help to ease the 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 symptoms. Uh, and the third one is definitely the scientific approach to that, uh, to, to, to that theme that, you know, people could be immune for a few months like a regular flu uh, season and, uh, and uh, that, might, that might do the trick, but uh, once it's scientifically proven. Until that, I don't see any brave, uh, any brave politician or, or businessman who would actually encourage this, you know, for people to get in, 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 in infected, not on purpose, but in mm -hmm. any way. And not to mention, I mean, I would say to you, I mean, you would be more than welcome to come to Slovenia. Please come if you're immune, but you can't get here. So first, let's get the world in, you know, to, to spin, to start spinning around and then, you know, go. Maybe if, it, if IKEA or some of these big companies starts making a cheap personal ventilator we all carry with us when we arrive, yeah. and if we yeah. show that we've got our own ventilator, that we've already Petra, had the disease. Petra, I have one, one question for Petra. Uh, how, David, go ahead. No, I was, I was about to ask Petra, how high is the percentage of uh, visitors coming from Italy to your city or to your country? Oh gosh, that's, we're going to hit, we, we will be hit hard even though we are optimistic i have to say we're optimistic we hope it's not going to be the worst case scenario but italians are not for a decade for decades on the first place and on top of that uh, we have uh, we have uh, 96 percent of foreign tourism and only for domestic so twice hit but Italians are resilient and optimistic and they love to go wherever they feel good and safe. So we are with them 100%. And with you guys from Spain too. But you know, there's yeah, also yeah, that different probably. countries have different perceptions of safety. 
I was talking to the um, tourism minister or tourism um, director from Jerusalem, and she said whenever there was a terrorist attack, she said that the Americans and Canadians would cancel their trips immediately and not return for like a year or two, whereas uh, the Italians and Russians never canceled their trips. They weren't scared at all. So there's certain kind of just, and a lot of that fear depends how far away you are from the place, but there's also just this general fear of certain countries that they are going to be more reluctant to turn to return to a place. They're more fickle. Um, True. So it's f figuring out which are these key markets who aren't scared as things come back online. And if it's a virus, again, it could be a younger demographic you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can tell you right now, having assuming, have you guys had it, by the way? Or you think you've had it or you might have had it? Or no, thank you. <laughs> I could say having gone through two weeks of unpleasantness, I, I want to get out there and travel. I, there's great travel deals. I can't go anywhere, but there's amazing deals if I could. I'd love to get out there. And I think being under lockdown, if you are already, when you're immune, theoretically, for a while, it's extra frustrating. And it's like here in Stockholm, in Sweden, where it's one of these crazy places where there is no lockdown at all. Life is like 90% like normal. So now I and a few of my friends have also, we think, had it. There's no good testing for it. We're going to restaurants. We're going out to bar. We're doing all this stuff because we feel like, like we have superpowers. Yeah. We can just... It's no. weird. I wouldn't, take, I wouldn't take those chances. Uh, in France, they are also under a relaxed, or they, they have been under relaxed lockdown, and now you can see the peak going up and up and up. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, from, uh, I'm not the immunologist. I'm just, I'm just talking about how the perception is, as you, the way you feel after you've, after you've done yeah. this. So if I can find a way to yeah. test it. Yeah. So. It, sorry, uh, just you know, just to, to tackle a little bit this different, um, um, uh, how should I say it, the different perception of safe, of safe, uh, being safe. Now, if you had a good uh, and uh, if you had a great, not only good um, uh, system working beforehand, not not the health issue, but how you were how you were um, uh, marketing your destination. If you were working on, you know, recurrent people, people are coming that are coming back, like in our case, Italians. Italians are keep uh, keeping, we're keeping coming back to us, so they know us well. That makes a huge difference. Whereas the first time comers, of course, they will first question all the basic questions and then go forward. But if you were uh, working on the guests that would uh, come back the uh before that would that will very well pay off now okay yeah. what what about um well what about service like uh, often there's never a good time to do service training and this is something that every destination in the world could be better at really is this yeah, a time I, when places should be doing service training i actually think that this is a time where you know th those companies and, and regions and destinations that that have the uh, option of doing that, they should be looking into the issues of quality and professionalism because I think that with growth in tourism, you always get a challenge. You know, you're always running to catch up rather than being ahead of the curve. And that was obviously a chance. But I wanted to mention two things that, that were mentioned before because you were talking about the people scared or the brave ones wanting to travel. But if we if we flip this around, if we look at people's perceptions of destinations in this crisis, uh, because at the end of the day, people will look at places just like they look at them maybe, well, unconsciously, because obviously it's very difficult to promote a place as a safe place, you know, because that's sort of, you know, you're setting yourself up for potential failure or accidents. But, yes. but at the end of the day, the perceptions of how countries have possibly, how countries have tackled this crisis now, this health crisis, how the healthcare systems have uh, coped, how the response has been, that can also install, install a sense of security in the area as a destination for visitors, because at the end of the day, it's the visitor that has to perceive that if he yeah. goes there, he or she will be safe. What do you Another, think is going to be most important on that? Do you think it's going to be most important to have like a respirators per capita, how high the hospitals are rated, or, or just the kind of the quick call to action like South Korea and Iceland did with their reaction, I, which is going to be the most important for people? 
I just think it's an overall perception of how the healthcare system works in that country. Okay. And how, you know, I, I think it's very, I think it's very difficult to start breaking that down onto any granular level, you know, at this okay. point in time. We'll also have to see how that thing works out. But in the meantime, because Petra mentioned the low percentage of domestic travel in her destination, I mean, that is also the fact for, for Iceland, for example. You know, domestic travel, because we're very few, obviously. <laughs> so domestic travel has always, has never been very, not been a major influence on receipts in tourism. And I think, unfortunately, that those countries might have bigger problems in resilience and bouncing back than those like, for example, let's say Germany, yep. you know, who have this big, you know, and, and even Spain who have this big tradition of people traveling, you know, and have a big yeah. bag of people who can travel, you know, domestically and then and in, in such a way restart the, the whole hospitality and, and, and tourism sector. So I think that will also be very interesting to see how that plays out. And come, just commenting on your domestic travel thing, what, what I was looking at, I mean, I grew up in the US, but I've been living here for 20, oh no, 18 years in Europe. But I kind of feel like every time there's the, Europe, the uh, Eurovision Song Contest or the World Cup or the Euro Cup, this, this generally calm Europe starts fighting, you know, they start wearing their national colors and like rave, waving these flags and, you know, running around like lunatics in a good way. But in a bad way, they started doing it during coronavirus suddenly got everyone got very protectionist it's you against us you can't come into our country we can't go into your country in a, a different but similar way and that may create some of those kind of fears as you said for the more domestic travel if people feel that they're just go over a border and then can't get back because of the way this is shown yeah, there's already a, a, a current here in spain uh, even friends of mine who are suggesting that uh, even if we we are able to to move to cross to other other countries and stuff that we should remain here i'm completely against protectionism because uh in spain even though we are 47 million inhabitants uh we depend a lot on foreign uh, visitors uh especially the balearics and the, and the canaries they have such a huge supply that just with spaniards um they can i don't know just maybe 30% of uh, occupancy will be covered with uh, with uh, domestic travelers. So I, I think it's a bit, maybe it's natural, but at the same time, it's a bit stupid to uh, focus, okay, let's stay here just to eat Spanish food. And I think that that's, that's wrong. And uh, I would never recommend uh, that. For, uh, and depends on the destinations. For example, um, going back to my location, the Basque Country, I know it's and it's not just about the quantity of visitors, but also let's say the quality. Even though I hate that, mm -hmm. that term of quality linked to uh, purchase uh, power, but for us and also for example for Madrid, the U.S. market is number one. It's very very important, uh, not just because of the number, because it's growing, and it's also seniors coming from the U.S. those who spend more. So we have to recalculate our supply and we have to recalculate our uh, markets because some of them may just vanish and maybe now we have too many beds we have too many restaurants and maybe we don't need all of them to be open because there are no clients for for all of them so it's it's a, a difficult uh, tough times also for uh, dmos to talk to entrepreneurs don't open it's better if you don't open this year that's a great point. Just like Olafa, you said, I'm going to get back to your second point in a second. But you know, you mentioned that places that have a stronger tradition of domestic tourism may do better after this. Also, a place that has a strong tradition of attracting older travelers may do worse. Mm -hmm. uh, flip side of that. But good, please go ahead. With, you had a second point you wanted to get to, like before we jumped in, took over. Olaf, you said no. you had like one and two. Yeah, there were two. One, the, the, the fright factor and the perceptions of the healthcare system. And the second was the domestic. Okay, the domestic. You, you got your point. Though. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Let me, I want to jump onto something else. And Petra, you can lead with this one. So the sort of the concept of that we shouldn't maybe be returning exactly to business as usual, but there's going to be this rush to recoup as much money as quickly as possible, any which way we can. 
I mean, should we be inviting the cruise ships back in, inviting all the tour buses back in, having that tourism over tourism concept that should we be, should we use this downtime to rethink carrying capacity in places? Oh, definitely. And I do hope that uh, majority, if not all destinations already started with that, uh, not only destinations, also businesses, like you mentioned, uh, uh, cruisers and so forth, because um, it's, it, it's not, we shouldn't go back to business as usual. We will not get go back to business as usual. Uh, it, that's the fact. It's it's going to change. So, I mean, at first it will change for for the health reasons, for the fear reasons, for the safety reasons, and uh, and all this and all that. But uh, at the end, uh, I think that you know it, it already started before with these changes of strategies, really strong lean towards sustainability everywhere. The only, I mean, the difference between back then and in the future, not now, because now we are free basically everywhere, will be that back then, a lot of times, this was a more of PR approach. In the future, it will have to be genuine or people just won't come because nowadays the, the genuine feelings to spread, feeling to spread and for others to, to read about it is that easy. So, it's uh, it it will it will change. So I understand correctly then. So you're saying, let's say when Venice opens back up, are they going to say instead of sixty thousand on their highest peak day, are they going to say twenty thousand on their highest peak day? Are they? They will, mean they will. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they already said that. Uh, they were brave enough to do that upfront already. So yes, that's how it should go forward and. People should spread more around the world. I mean, there are so many beautiful places to be discovered and everyone understands must see needs to be seen. But if not this year, then sorry, next year. But isn't that a question of like the tail has been wagging the dog that if there's more demand, someone just starts putting up more hotels or opening more Airbnbs and the airlines just start landing more planes and the city doesn't have the power or the destination doesn't have the power to stop it. So our, does that mean that we're gonna need to have new political um, decisions made to give destinations more power to set limits? That definitely needs that. It, sh it should happen already in the past. Unfortunately, it didn't because, and, I'm, and I personally also don't believe that people will just, I mean, People will uh, change their approaches, their way of thinking, their maybe some to some sort of values, but it, we won't change like you know 180 percent and go towards completely different direction. Uh, the the profit will be important, but uh, it it will give us the time how to uh, how to to build it more more. Mm, more more wisely or you know slow more slowly uh, and so forth and the political decision would have to be here much more important than they used to be in 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 the past but not only from you know certain governments but also from the world leaders who do have impact and still don't quite get it uh, one thing and another thing is also EU in general stronger approach now it's they're hardly felt so we, we all need to start moving much much quicker than we are moving now okay like I said we're freezed now but we are expecting much quicker steps than they used to be right because we will have this period as this thing fades into a more normal lifestyle that the things will people will be more relaxed out in public more and without tourists so they are going to experience life like that and see that they can survive without tourists. What do you think? Oh, if you were going to jump in and say something, I could see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because you mentioned the political sphere in this. I think that at the end of the day, uh, the <clears throat> tourism, and I think that we were learning that in the decade, you know, leading up to this, tourism, I mean, in emerging destinations and in, in before, tourism was often seen as something very organic. It just happened. You know, people yeah. came, there was a restaurant, there was a b and and everybody was really happy. And then we were realizing that, that it wasn't that. You know, it needed tourism like other, other industries could be very, very ecologically unsound, very unsustainable, have tremendous negative societal effects. 
And I think that there was a, a, a growing understanding of the fact that there needed to be political leadership and brave political leadership right. sometimes. So I think that that will happen. Yeah, I, I think that, and I think that one of the things that we need to then then realize is that maybe you know maybe this will maybe the virus itself and the health scare will lead to differences in how for example airlines operate because you know i think you mentioned the airlines the low budget airlines maybe this will lead to a revamping of the airline industry again because you know all these tight seat rows you know where you sit like this maybe that won't be a viable option for at least the years to come and that in itself will lessen the load or the burden for for destinations that can't that don't have the savvy to be able to sort of set their own standards in that. We're all going to travel first class on Emirates with our own little cabins now. <laughs> like David, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you. We're running out of time. I'm going to give you last word on this one. You were the last one to get started, so uh, share your share your thoughts on this. All the stuff we've been just talking about. No, I was just just about to say that some uh, elements, some parts of the uh, tourism industry will suffer most. Airlines, I think already the low cost uh, business model was already vanishing, somehow was fading. Uh, also, with a shift of society towards a, a more uh, mindful, sustainable uh, perspective of life in general and, and travel. Cruise industry, again, was another, uh, another uh, part of our industry was uh, under discussion because of their capacity to, to uh, contaminate and pollute, pollute in mice, and that, 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 that really affects me, um, I'm really pity about that, but mice industry, yes, we will be moving maybe from macro to micro events, uh, we don't know how many attendees, but also mice industry will be suffer uh, a lot. And again, we have to recalculate uh, the supply side. Maybe we had already way too many hotels, too much capacity. And well, at least one good thing now we are we aren't hearing much about over tourism. I was up to here with about uh, over tourism. So for a couple of years, I hope we can focus on something different uh, and not just over tourism and touristification. All right. Well, it seems like that wraps it up. I was going to say I'm not. I don't live so far from where I Greta Thunberg. Uh, is from here in Stockholm and it's almost like she gave her warning and like Moses banged her staff and put this biblical plague on the planet because we weren't paying enough attention to what she was saying uh, <laughs> without paying the price for it. It sort of feels that way a little bit um, but I, we, as you all said we're all going to get through this at some point. Uh, it's yeah. a question of time and hopefully we'll be smarter on the other side. Yeah and let's not forget that this crisis surfaced so much humor and it is, I love this part of it. And, you know, with not being so gloomy and doomy, on the other hand, also, the, you know, a lot of concerts and everything are happening on the balconies, on the roofs and so forth. And people who used to call the police beforehand for that are now cheering and clapping. So good things are coming out of it too. Yeah, so I wish you all that you stay healthy and that your Netflix accounts don't get canceled. Um, <laughs> have a <one. laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's really been a it's been a pleasure, and uh, I'm gonna turn things back over to uh, Fabian if he's still uh, here. Maybe he's just thank you, back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.